If you like The Dig, another podcast you might like is Belabored, a Descent Magazine podcast hosted by Michelle Chen and Sarah Jaffe. Belabored has been bringing you fresh and original labor reporting for today's working class since 2013, featuring labor leaders like Karen Lewis of the Chicago Teachers Union, Sarah Nelson of the Association of Flight Attendants, CWA, labor historians and scholars like Cal Winslow, Eileen Boris, Bill Fletcher Jr., and Raj Patel, and rank-and-file workers from around the world. Sarah and Michelle provide context, history, and strategic insights for people navigating the workplace and organizing for power. One recent episode you might like is Belabored Number 200 with Stacey Davis-Gates of the Chicago Teachers Union. Stacy discusses the ongoing struggles to fight racism in the school system and in the labor movement, the thorny issue of police unions, and lays out a compelling argument for why bargaining for the common good is not just a nice idea, but a necessity. Stacy argues, quote, Our classrooms are being used as a shelter. Our cafeterias are being used as supermarkets. So to not center that when you are negotiating a contract is not just a missed opportunity. It's malpractice. The episode also features a look at the dock workers shutting down the West Coast ports as part of the Movement for Black Lives, the Supreme Court's ruling on working while queer or trans, and the ongoing realities of work during a pandemic. It is essential listening for everyone who works for a living. And that is probably almost all of you. Welcome to The Dig, a podcast from Jacobin Magazine. My name is Daniel Denver, and I'm broadcasting from Providence, Rhode Island, a place from which, according to our neighboring states, I am suddenly not allowed to leave without a negative COVID test or a two-week quarantine, thinking through this reality. That our politics' obsession with guarding our borders against external enemies— of pretending that keeping those bad guys out would keep our exceptional American people safe, all while defunding and neglecting every sort of social and health and economic thing that might have actually kept people safe. That this has all contributed mightily to this disaster and the resulting situation of soft borders being erected to curb domestic travel between states. It is a deeply messed up and revealing irony. This episode is about the Border Patrol. U.S. Customs and Border Protection, home to the Border Patrol, is this country's largest law enforcement agency. But in the early 1990s, Border Patrol had just around 4,000 agents. By the time Trump took office, it boasted a force of roughly 20,000. Just as Trump's brazen xenophobia has for many suddenly revealed the existence of a massive deportation and immigration enforcement machine constructed by Trump's bipartisan predecessors, the president's deployment of Border Patrol tactical unit, BORTAC, agents to repress domestic dissent in Portland has suddenly made it clear that the long bipartisan border war has created a powerful central government police force that can act with impunity anywhere. As my returning guest today, Kelly Lytle Hernandez, puts it, welcome to the borderlands. Border Patrol has long subjected Mexican and Mexican-American people throughout vast swaths of the Southwest and beyond to policing, surveillance, detention, search, humiliation, and brutality. The Border Patrol has grown to its present-day monstrous size by pledging to keep bad outsiders— immigrants, drug smugglers, terrorists, out. While the deeply connected system of mass incarceration and American policing have metastasized on the pretext of keeping bad people, outsiders on the inside of American life, locked up inside prisons. Unsurprisingly, what we see today is that these carceral forces built up to protect the American people against these various outside others are now freewheeling forces of repression in the hands of President Trump. The wars abroad and at the border have always provided a justification for the construction of expansive systems of repression that menace a growing number of people everywhere. 
This is what happens when you give up your freedom in the name of protecting your freedom against a spectacular evil that purportedly threatens your freedom. This is the neoliberal state continuously returning to its Schmidian impulse to protect the repressive state through more repression. This is what happens when U.S. empire, in a period of simultaneous expansion and crisis, quixotic wars, record inequality, and now an out-of-control plague as the planet tilts into climate chaos, makes a narrowly circumscribed conception of security its fundamental principle of governance. This security principle was the principle adopted by the border and crime wars launched by Bill Clinton and by the war on terror launched with bipartisan support under George W. Bush. All wars continued by Barack Obama, the guy who was elected to exercise the Bush administration's demons. The enforced border functions to create the illusion of a discreet and secure nation-state amid the chaos and contradictions of global empire and capitalism. But border enforcement always expands both outward and inward, the pivot point between an interlinked military and policing system that knows no bounds. The settlement of the contradictions, these projections of law and order, of a neat division between inside and outside, always prove to be provisional. The contradiction between the U.S.'s global exercise of neocolonial power, on the one hand, and our Heronvoke settler politics hidden behind the Cold War's frayed liberal garb can't be permanently reconciled. Neither can the contradiction between a capitalist order's demand for a caste of racialized labor and that same order producing a white supremacist politics that seeks to expel and thus deny the value produced by those racialized worker others. Coronavirus, traveling along capitals, cross-border circuits, and exposing the security state's spectacular inability to make people's lives actually secure, appears to be a turning point. But to understand all of this, we got to go back to 1924, when the Border Patrol was founded to enforce the country's newly expansive and brazenly racist immigration restriction regime, to understand it as the successor to the Mounted Guard, which was founded in 1904, whose Mounted Guard Chinese inspectors sought to enforce Chinese exclusion, and also a successor to the white supremacist settler violence of the Texas Rangers. Back to when, quote, Border Patrol's policing of Mexican immigrants created a powerful yet contested institution in the borderlands by introducing a new regime of authority over the region's labor supply. The history behind today's monstrous Border Patrol is the topic of Kelly Lytle Hernandez's brilliant book, Migra, A History of the U.S. Border Patrol. And that is what I'm discussing with Kelly Lytle Hernandez today. Lytle Hernandez writes history in a way unlike anyone I know. She writes these beautiful stories woven together with poetic prose that bring her careful archival research to life on the page. In 2017, I interviewed her on her book City of Inmates, Conquest, Rebellion, and the Rise of Human Caging in Los Angeles, 1771 to 1965. And I'll link to that episode in the show notes. I'll add that this book, Migra, was instrumental in helping me write my own book, All-American Nativism. I cannot recommend it enough. Anyhow, a short interlude. These episodes are only possible because you, my dear listeners, support this podcast at patreon.com slash the dig. Preparing for these interviews paying my wonderful producer, Alex Lewis, to produce these interviews, running our book club. All of that takes money. And The Dig is here for a nakedly political purpose, to provide you, people organizing to transform the world, with the analysis that you need to do that. That is why we are providing every episode always free to everyone with no paywall so that everyone can listen regardless of their ability to pay. But if you can afford to support us, that's where you come in. We can only make this podcast freely available to everyone because those of you listening who can afford to do so 
contribute at patreon.com slash the dig. Take a quick moment to hit pause and contribute now if you have not done so already. That is p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash the dig. Thank you. Okay, here is Kelly Lytle Hernandez, a professor of history, African American studies, and urban planning at UCLA. She is the author of Migra and City of Inmates, and also the director and principal investigator for Million Dollar Hoods, a university-based, community-driven research project that maps the fiscal and human cost of mass incarceration in Los Angeles. Kelly Lido Hernandez, welcome back to The Dig. Oh, thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure. Why is understanding the first half century or so of the history of the Border Patrol, a time when it was a relatively little known agency outside of the borderlands, why is that important to understanding what it has become, particularly since the 1990s, since when it has roughly quintupled in size and is now the face of this high profile border security politics under presidents of both parties and now under Trump? part of a border security police entity that is being deployed to repress political dissent. Why is this history important? Well, history writ large is important because um, it is the the DNA of of who we are. Um, The origin story of the Border Patrol is that it was begun with the intention um, and the DNA to be a white supremacist organization, police organization. And that has remained consistent over time. And I mean, I'd love to go back and spend a little time talking about these early days of the Border Patrol, but what you're seeing on the streets today is a president who has articulated a firm commitment to white supremacy, calling out a law enforcement agency that was, if not the first, one of the first in terms of the fraternal order of retired Border Patrol officers. Their association came out early in support of Donald Trump's candidacy for president. And he has called them out to suppress the uprising for black life that is now unfolding across the country. So it's entirely unsurprising to me that the Border Patrol was um, the law enforcement agency on tap to do this work for this president. Um, He could have great faith in what the Border Patrol would deliver on the streets of this country would be in line with the vision of making America great again that he has laid out. You mentioned the Border Patrol being founded as a white supremacist organization. You write about the the kind of prehistory of the Border Patrol in terms of the conquest settlement of Texas. And you write that Anglo-American farmers use the violence perpetrated by the Texas Rangers to make, quote, South Texas into a region dominated by Anglo-American farmers. And These were not Jeffersonian ideal type smallholders, but rather these factories in the field made possible by these huge irrigation and transportation projects that incorporated the Southwest so recently conquered from Mexico into American capitalism. So an opening question to set the scene for the rise of the Border Patrol, how did South Texas agribusiness and and Southwestern agribusiness in general, fit into American political economy at the time? And how did that in turn transform the region? As late as the early 20th century and the remain pockets where it's true today, South Texas um, was and is a Mexicano majority set of counties um, and communities. And the penetration of Anglo-American capital came relatively late to that region. How did they get access to the principal asset of the region? Land was through a variety of methods. Um, South Texas passed a series of tax laws that made it difficult for ranching families to hold on to their properties. The property would be auctioned off. Benjamin Johnson speaks about this quite a bit um, in his work. They also used racial terror. And so the the rise of anti-Mexican lynchings in the early 20th century in South Texas is directly related to the penetration of Anglo-American capital into the region and the search for one, land and access to cheap land by 
scaring off uh, Mexican landholders, and also about access to a marginalized and highly policed uh, Mexican migrant labor force. And so that's how that happened in the early 20th century, where you have the arrival of Anglo-American capital, and they gain access to land that had been claimed by Mexican landholders for decades, if not centuries, in a, a long historical battle with um, the various indigenous communities of the region. Um, that's how that transition happened, was through largely tax law and through racial terror. Mexicans weren't the, the only exploited and expropriated racialized group living under an Anglo-American capitalism at the time, but they were the group that became core to the entire Southwestern economy. You write that in California, genocide had made indigenous labor unavailable. Chinese exclusion after 1882 meant that Chinese workers were not a viable option. You write that outside of South Texas, where where slavery had existed, there was resistance to black migration. Even with South Texas, black Southerners were migrating north because of the World War I-fueled Great Migration. Japanese workers were too organized and militant. Same with Filipinos who could continue to come even after Asian exclusion because they were colonial nationals, at least until immigration, Filipino immigration was shut off in 1934 as part of the legislation that allowed for the independence of the Philippines. And so agribusiness looked to Mexican labor. How did they that play out both both in California, Arizona, and also in South Texas? And how were Mexicans fit into the into the country's prevailing black white divide? Well, this is a good question. So you have the the tensions, the economic and cultural tensions within white supremacy really flaring up during this time period. You have the capitalists who are saying we need to have access to a marginalized, racialized labor force, temporary labor force. And you have the cultural nationalists, ethnocultural nationalists who are saying, no, we want to have an entirely pure white society. We don't want to have any racialized outsiders here. And so they're all doing battle with each other during this time period, passing legislation back and forth about the construction of white power and, and you know, what the dynamics of that would be. As the exclusionists gain ground through a variety of immigration restrictions that categorically brand a Asian immigrants from arriving in the country, that create a set of pressures that would discourage Black migration into the region, and that violently, rapaciously claimed land from Indigenous folks through um, war and broken treaties. What happened was the agribusiness folks, the railroads, figured out that they really only had one source of racialized, marginalized labor left, and that was Mexican immigrants. And so they aggressively went after and encouraged Mexicans to immigrate to the United States in the early 20th century to take jobs up here. And so the, the rise of Mexican immigration, which begins in the early 20th century, happens really at the bequest of U.S. employers who are going down into Mexico and recruiting Mexicans to come north. At the same time, in Mexico, there is a man who is president, um, really a dictator, who rules Mexico between roughly 1876 and 1911. His name is Porfirio Diaz. And he has put Mexico on a path of rapid modernization. What this meant was that Diaz was passing legislation and enforcing legislation that diminished indigenous and communal land rights. So people were losing access to their land. Campesinos are being displaced and turned into wage workers. So at the same time that Diaz, with U.S. and European investors, is rapidly modernizing the Mexican economy in ways that is displacing um, campesinos and indigenous communities, you have U.S. labor recruiters going down into Mexico and inviting these displaced um, persons to come north to work. So the bonds that happened between the U.S. and Mexican economy were constructed during this time period. And that is the foundation of Mexican migration to the United States, is the, the woven nature of the U.S. and Mexican economies that happened during the early 20th century. Initially, you write that the Border Patrol 
was not so much focused on on Mexicans for a brief moment, but far more interested in in closing the so-called backdoor to banned Asian and restricted European migrants, people who used to arrive by sea. You write, quote, The majority of persons standing trial in U.S. district courts were Chinese, Japanese, Eastern European, and East Indian immigrants who had evaded U.S. immigration restrictions by entering the United States without sanction. Therefore, to prevent unlawful entry to the United States, three days after passing the National Origins Act of 1924, Congress set aside $1 million to establish a land border patrol in the Immigration Bureau of the U.S. Department of Labor. How did the nativist politics of the National Origins Quota era shape the early border patrol? Because while the quota system was abolished in 1965, the border patrol, which was created to enforce it, has not only survived, but wildly metastasized. Oh, it has thrived in the age of mass incarceration. Absolutely. So let's talk about the National Origins Act of 1924. That was the pinnacle moment of... U.S. immigration restrictions leading to a whites-only immigration policy. So certainly beginning with the 1882 Chinese Exclusion Act, leading through the Geary Act of 1892, which um, not only banned Chinese laborers from entering the country, but created the first immigrant registration system um, in the country. Um, The later exclusion of all Asian immigrants to the country that really all leads to the passage of the 1924 National Origins Act, which sets up a quota system that reserves over 90% of all quota slots for European immigrants um, to enter the United States while banning um, all Asian immigrants. And so what this quota law puts together is is, um, the long quest for a whites-only immigration system was written into law. That's what the U.S. Border Patrol was established to enforce three days after the passage of the National Origins Act. So the legislators in Washington, D.C., um, at that moment were thinking about largely the Asian immigrants who were evading um, the National Origins Act by crossing you know, without authorization. But what really happens on the ground is quite different. Who was hired to be Border Patrol officers during the, the 1920s? are largely these local guys from the border region. They are typically um, working class guys who maybe had been ticket takers um, at the the local theater or tram operators. They did not own land. They overwhelmingly were white men who did not have access to land in a region that where power was grounded in land ownership. So what happens with these guys who get guns, get badges, eventually get uniforms, and they get federal authorization to go out there and force this whites-only immigration legislation, which is expansive, could be enforced in so many different ways, is that they seize a bit of power for themselves in their own local communities by spending less time thinking about the Asian immigrants and European immigrants who are coming through the region, and instead focusing their attention on policing the principal labor source of the region, which is Mexican immigrants. And so that's how you get this transition from a broad whites only immigration law to a really targeted focus on Mexican immigrants almost exclusively within the first couple years of the establishment of the U.S. Border Patrol. You write that the Border Patrol was a vehicle for economic and social advancement for white working class people in the borderlands, an opportunity to achieve status through policing that was simultaneously about race making and in labor control. You write, quote, in contrast to the borderland farmers whose vocal and persuasive protest halted congressional efforts to limit Mexican immigration, average white workers in the region often interpreted Mexican immigration as a source of competition in the labor market. This in the borderlands was a new source of power and the Border Patrol's working class officers leveraged their federal authority to police unsanctioned migration in complicated and often contradictory ways that were only consistent in their mindfulness of opportunities to extract bits of dignity, respect, status, and power from the region's social elite by policing their workforce. 
the Border Patrol's turn to policing Mexicans, in other words, was much more than a matter of simply servicing the interests of agribusiness in capitalist economic development. It was a matter of community, manhood, whiteness, authority, class, respect, belonging, brotherhood, and violence in the greater Texas-Mexico borderlands. Really incredible paragraph. How was it that that border policing in particular became this avenue for status advancement? And what does that in turn reveal about the importance of avoiding overly simplistic, deterministic accounts of the role of, of immigration enforcement or any sort of repressive apparatus in terms of the role it, function it, it has within capitalist political economy? Mm. And the function it can have within an individual's life, right. right, within the context that they live. Right. Well, this is about the complexity of white supremacy for the white working class, right, and the white impoverished. So what happens in this context is you have these small borderland communities that are dominated by local large landholders who are almost exclusively white by the time you get to the 1920s. And these folks would really control almost every aspect of local politics and culture. So you have young white men coming of age in this area that would be disparaged as white trash from the time that they were children um, as they're growing into adulthood. And what they're able to do with the Border Patrol in particular as a federal law enforcement agency is they, they find an escape hatch to get around these local um, power brokers to find their own piece of authority and they wield it um, as much as they possibly can to extract respect from the people who had been degrading them since they were children, right? So this is very personal for many of the officers. They're not necessarily thinking about the national political scene when it comes to the development of whites only immigration system. They're thinking about how do I tell that asshole over there who's been calling me names since I was a child that he's got to respect me? I do it through managing his labor force. If I can deny him access to the workers who will cannot pick the melons in his fields today and they can rot there, I now have a position of power in this community. And so in, in many cases, that's what you're seeing happen in these communities across the borderlands is the young middle-aged white men who are hired as border patrol officers are going from farm to farm, <laughs> extracting power from the local head honchos. In addition to this, you have a smaller number of Mexican-American officers who were hired specifically for maybe language abilities, right? Who were identified and recruited for language abilities. And these guys join with a very similar but different politics in mind. Um, and in many cases, there is a quest to separate themselves from the large number of Mexican immigrants who are entering the region. And so by joining the Border Patrol, they place themselves above incoming immigrants. They set themselves apart from incoming immigrants and they help to construct themselves as part of this narrative of whiteness, which is broadening during this time period to include a variety of ethnic communities, Italian immigrants, for example, Irish immigrants, you know, the boundaries of whiteness are broadening in the aftermath of the passage of the National Origins Act, which as May Nye says, draws a circle, a large circle around all of Europe and says, you all are inside now. Asian immigrants are on the outside. Which is ironic because the National Origins Quote is also very much targeted, the people who would become the white ethnics, the Italians, the Polish but it targeted them in a way that was for restriction rather than exclusion. Right. Absolutely. And so unintended consequences, in fact, broadens the boundaries of whiteness, right? And the way it plays By out. By becoming hyphenated whites. Yes, ethnics. Um, and so you see a, a good number of the Mexican-American officers trying to gain access to that broadening of, of whiteness. And they work very hard to distinguish themselves from the Mexican immigrants and to, for example, insist on being called Spanish American as opposed to Mexican American. And so these early Mexican American officers joined the fold and they are also very much engaged in a local politics of race and power um, in the borderlands. From the get go, 
nativists wanted Mexicans out too. They were not included in the national origins quotas. Indeed, the Western Hemisphere did not have any of these immigration restrictions or exclusions imposed on it. At least people from of a nationality that was deemed to correspond to nations in the Western Hemisphere, I guess, to be more precise. But nativists certainly wanted Mexicans out. One congressman said, quote, what is the use of closing the front door to keep out undesirables from Europe when you permit Mexicans to come in here by the back door by the thousands and thousands? Our great Southwest is rapidly creating for itself a new racial problem, as our old South did when it imported slave labor from Africa. But S. Parker Frissel, who you quote uh, from the California Farm Bureau Federation, he assured nativists that Western business had white supremacy under control. He said, quote, we in California think we can handle that social problem. And then you quote an agribusinessman from Texas similarly saying, quote, if we could not control the Mexicans and they would take this country, it would be better to keep them out. But we can and do control them. How did growers amid this period of extreme xenophobia and nativism that in so many cases, including the National Origins Quotas Act, overcame business opposition, longstanding business opposition to restriction, how did Southwestern growers, due to their demand for Mexican labor, racialize Mexicans as distinctly dominable, docile, and I think critically easily returnable to Mexico to appease nativists? And, and how did that instrumental racialization take shape on the ground in the Southwest? This is a really important question. Um, one of the issues that becomes vital in these debates about whether or not to allow Mexican immigrants to enter the country is their deportability. And so the Border Patrol's work, its shift toward focusing on Mexican immigrants becomes key during this time period. Because again, remember, the Border Patrol is pretty small. It could have been doing a lot of different things. For example, it could have been going to hospitals to look for immigrants who had fallen ill and therefore were in violation of the various public health orders around immigration control. They had been could have been going to um, social welfare organizations and looking for recent immigrants who were in need of food or of financial support. That too would have been a violation, um, would have been a um, public charge. These are all ways that the Border Patrol could have done their work. Um, they also could have just been out in the borderlands exclusively looking for, for example, Chinese, East Indian, um, South Asian immigrants. They really focused on Mexicans. And that focus concentrates this new political category of being deportable on the Mexican population because they're the most vulnerable to deportation, the most presumed to be deportable. And it's that deportability that is regarded as what enhances the value of Mexican workers because it decreases, is presumed, their ability to protest, to, to demand higher wages, to demand better working conditions because we'll simply call the Border Patrol and have you removed. That is really key um, when agribusiness in the West is looking out and they see a sea of immigration restrictions. And from their perspective, they could either invite African-American workers West to come work in the fields of California, Arizona, the American West. They also thought this about Puerto Ricans and, as well, or they could bring in Mexican immigrants. And when they looked at these two populations and they're making these calculations, they articulate that the problem with African-Americans is that we're citizens, we're permanent, not removable. Whereas Mexican immigrants who had come to embody deportability could be easily removed. And this is a big part of why the agribusinessmen, from their perspective, decided to focus upon recruiting Mexican workers. So here's the irony. You have these local white guys who become border patrol officers, who use federal authority to extract a measure of dignity from these guys who have been disparaging them their whole lives, that actually generates new opportunities for the agribusinessmen by concentrating deportability on Mexican workers. Um, so this is how this develops over time. And Mexican workers are seen as being 
or is developing as a race apart from African Americans, Asian immigrants, and what's so key is their deportability. In that, what's so key in that racialization is the deportability factor. And this anxiety over the permanence of Black presence in the United States reflects this really pervasive white supremacist anti-slavery sentiment that animated everything from antebellum colonization politics to, to Teddy Roosevelt. Yeah, this is the extraordinary thing about the establishment of the United States in both enslavement and removal is the flexibility of white settler colonialism, white supremacy, racial capitalism over time, that it is so deeply embedded in our DNA that regardless of what strategy is taken, the strategy always bends toward Black subjugation and Native removal. And so these debates, people always say, well, what's progressive or what's conservative? Irrelevant. They both trend in the same direction, right? So we can bring this right up to the current moment about how we created this beast called mass incarceration. Well, the left and the right are both complicit in its creation. And it, it's because it's part of the long durée of Black and Indigenous experiences in the United States that tend in those directions. Um, so this is a part of that story of the durability, the flexibility of white supremacy over time um, in terms of the battles that are happening over Mexican immigration, whether it's about inclusion or exclusion, they're both predicated upon how do we maintain white supremacy. A follow-up question in terms of the national origins period and the construction of the racialization of Mexicans. In 1929, as a SOP to attempt to placate the nativists, grower-aligned political forces that wanted to keep Mexican immigration from being restricted helped make illegal entry and re-entry federal misdemeanors and felonies, respectively. And this is something that you write about in, I think, more depth in City of Prisons. But how did the criminalization of unauthorized migration emerge from what we've been discussing, how Mexican migrants were distinctly racialized in this heyday of nativist restriction? And how did that reshape the borderlands and the border patrol? Because these are laws from, from so long ago that I think until they came up as a subject of debate in the recent Democratic primary were kind of unknown to many Americans. But these are laws that were not only used extensively under Bush and then Obama, but then also served as the legal basis for Trump's notorious family separations. The laws that you're talking about are today known as U.S. Code 1325 and 1326, which is the federal misdemeanor of entering the United States without authorization and the federal felony of returning to the United States without authorization after deportation. The felony charge is the leading cause of prosecution that is leading, sending people to federal prison today. It is a massive, highly significant piece of legislation that was first drafted and developed and voted on and accepted in 1929. So let's talk about our current predicament and how it developed in the 1920s. Now, after the passage of the National Origins Act in 1924, which was a whites-only immigration law with, as you say, this exemption, this backdoor written into it that was demanded by agribusiness um, and railroads in the West to allow Mexican immigrants in particular to keep flowing in, and most important, flowing out of the United States. The cultural nationalists, the nativists, were always unsatisfied with this deal although they made it in 1924 to get the, the other pieces of the legislation. And they continued throughout the 1920s to press and to prod and to push to get Mexican immigrants included on the list of either banned immigrants or a quota placed upon them. So only a certain number would be allowed to enter the country each year. Throughout the 1920s, agribusiness pushes back and says, look, you've, we, you, you've locked out all the Chinese immigrants, you've locked out the Japanese immigrants, we've now um, heading toward locking out Filipinos. We launched a campaign of, they didn't say it, but genocide against indigenous populations here in California. We don't want African Americans to come because of their citizenship status and because of downright anti-Blackness. All we've got is Mexican immigrants. We got to keep this door open. So they're fighting with each other throughout the 1920s. And it's reaching a fever pitch by 1929. And in steps this 
congressman from South Carolina, the hills of South Carolina, named Coleman Livingston Bleese. And working with the U.S. Secretary of Labor, they came up with a piece of legislation to find a compromise between these two battling sides of white supremacy. And that compromise is we won't put a numerical limit on the number of Mexicans who are allowed to enter the country every year. Instead, we'll try to control the flow of Mexicans into the United States by forcing them to come through the ports of entry where we can open and close the gates at whim and at will by criminalizing any border crossings that happen between those ports of entry. So the passage of the March 4th, 1929 Immigration Act, which first criminalized unauthorized entry into the United States is fundamentally a compromise between the dueling sides of white supremacy um, of the 1920s. And that is the law that is sending more people to federal prison today than any other piece of legislation. Now, of course, drug crime falls right behind it, right? And then, you know, frankly, they go back and forth. But the Jim Crow drug war, which has so disproportionately impacted African Americans, and what I call the Bleece Law of the 1920s are really the two realms of federal law and law enforcement that are filling our federal prisons today. You write, quote, Confronted by a new regime of U.S. immigration control, a regime increasingly dedicated to policing Mexicans, Mexican labor migrants had to make new choices when they reached the northern edge of Mexico. They could either deliver themselves for inspection and be confronted with unaffordable fees, humiliating exams, and the possibility of exclusion, or they could try their luck at illicitly crossing the border and cautiously avoiding the border patrol. How did authorized and unauthorized migration patterns and systems develop in tandem? And and why, given that there were no numerical restrictions on Mexican migration into the U.S. until the 60s and 70s. Why did so many Mexicans find it preferable to cross illegally? Well, the border was a relatively new concept in the 1920s. People were um, across the region used to informally crossing the border. Um, U.S. citizens, Mexican citizens, everybody was. This is a practice of the borderlands. So the notion of a border patrol was something that it was going to take the nation and these communities a long time to get to you get used to, right? So there's certainly just the culture and the tradition of the borderlands where the border is really literally just a line in the sand, a line down the river. So there's that issue certainly for the first couple of years. There's also what's happening at the ports of entry. And historians have done quite a bit of work documenting how unaffordable the entry fees, the head taxes were for Mexican immigrants in comparison to what they were being paid again, and this regime of Corfeo Diaz in Mexico, where he had invited U.S. and European capitalists to come in to not even buy up all the land, but be given all of the land, and then to pay poverty, misery wages to Mexican workers. The head fees were simply unaffordable. In addition to that, there were the humiliating questions um, for women in particular, the presumption that they may be crossing the border to engage in prostitution. There were the the delousing baths, um, washing people in gasoline because they were presumed to be dirty upon entrance. Um, All of this was happening at the ports of entry. So it's no surprise that people continued the informal traditions of crossing the border without inspection between the ports of entry. The Bracero program brought millions of Mexican guest workers to the U.S. between 1942 and 1964. And it obviously has to be at the center of any history of U.S. immigration, Border Patrol included. You quote mid-century labor activist Dr. Ernesto Galarza as saying, quote, Is this indentured alien an almost perfect model of the economic man, an input factor stripped of political and social attributes that liberal democracy likes to ascribe to all human beings ideally? Is this Bracero the prototype of the production of man of the future? What was the Bracero program? And was Galarza basically right in the way that he described it? Well, first of all, I'm always happy to hear the words of Ernesto Galarza, who, if I live long enough, I will certainly write a biography of this extraordinary intellectual and organizer 
from the mid-century to late 20th century, who was really connecting the dots between um, anti-Blackness and the creation of the undocumented worker and the Bracero worker. So um, I, I just encourage people to Google Ernesto Galarza and learn a little bit more about this unsung labor hero um, in U.S. and Mexican history. Now, the Bracero program, as you said, operated between the early 40s and the mid-1960s and brought about 2.5 million Mexican workers into the United States on about 4 million contracts um, to work on short-term contracts, about six months each. And the way that this was understood and organized was that Mexicans, also a few folks from the Caribbean as well, but largely Mexicans, would come in as single men from the countryside experience in agricultural labor and work in the United States for six months, live out in the hinterlands, in the migrant camps, and then go to hell home, right? That you would only be bringing the braceros, the brazos, the arms in, not the full body, not the full human. So you could extract the labor from them and then send the humans back to Mexico. That was how the program was conceived. Of course, full human beings came to the United States and you know, there's some really interesting work that's been coming out about Maria Losa's work on the defiant Bracero that showed up um, in the United States and um, refused to comply, for example, with heteronormative ideas about um, the Mexican family staying back in Mexico and then Mexican workers just coming up here and working and then going home that they engaged in all kinds of pleasure and leisure because they were full human beings, of course. That was the vision of the Bracero program. It was violated constantly um, by individual Braceros. It was also violated because all sorts of people who didn't fit the norm of the Bracero also came north in need of work. Young people, youth came north, and women in particular came north in search of work. And so you had two streams of labor that were operating between the United States and Mexico during this time period, the so-called short-term Bracero worker, and then the so-called undocumented worker, um, which was certainly male, but increasingly female and young. And so you had the structuring of two different labor flows um, during this, this period. The Mexican government was not a, a passive party to the Bracero program. The U.S. and the growers needed the Mexican government, and the Mexican government used that leverage toward various ends that you describe. More virtuously, they pushed for higher wages, and in 1948, they used the Mexican military and law enforcement to block migration until a new wage agreement was settled. But in 1949, they also used Mexican troops, you write, to force aspiring migrants to labor on Mexican cotton farms to make up for a labor shortage, and Mexico created its own border patrol in 1953, it pushed the U.S. to track to to crack down on unauthorized migrants, and threatened to even pull back, pull out of the entire, or pull back from the entire Bracero program, if a crackdown wasn't forthcoming. What is revealed that's otherwise obscured when we analyze the Mexican government's active role in policing Mexican labor migration? Well, capital and the interests of capital is not um, solely isolated in the United States to begin. Um, so there are interests within Mexico that um, the Mexican government, of course, is responsible to represent. Now, what's interesting there, which I don't go too much into depth in the book, is that, in fact, um, when the Mexican government is representing the interests of, an, of business in Mexico, that often is the case of representing U.S. investor interests, in fact. So it's the importance of the growing power of U.S. investment around the world, but certainly um, and primarily in Mexico at the beginning of the 20th century and all the way through to the present moment, that it becomes difficult to understand whose interests are being represented by different governments. So when the Mexican government stands up to control the flow of migration, funnel all migration through the Bracero program to limit the exodus of Mexican workers to keep laborers south of the border to pick cotton, to, to mine and do other labor, that it has some local interest, but it also is reflective of 
U.S. investors in Mexico who are um, invested in La Laguna area, the cotton farming area, and um, just south of the border in Baja, California. Um, so there's a, a level of complexity there about whose interests are being represented by these separate nation states. I'm Aziz Rana, and you're listening to The Dig, a great place for analysis about where we are, how we got here, and what can be done. It's my favorite podcast, and you can support it at patreon.com. This episode of The Dig is brought to you by our listeners who support us at patreon.com and by Verso Books, which has loads of great left-wing titles, perfect for Dig listeners like you. One that you might like is Fully Automated Luxury Communism, a Manifesto by Aaron Bastani. In the 21st century, new technologies should liberate us from work. Automation shouldn't undermine an economy built on full employment, but instead should be the path to a world of liberty, luxury, and happiness for everyone. Technological advance will reduce the value of commodities, food, healthcare, and housing towards zero. In fully automated luxury communism, Aaron Bastani conjures a vision of extraordinary hope, showing how we move to energy abundance, feed a world of 9 billion, overcome work, transcend the limits of biology, and establish meaningful freedom for everyone. Rather than a final destination, such a society merely heralds the real beginning of history. Fully Automated Luxury Communism, a manifesto by Aaron Bastani, out now in paperback from Verso Books. Mexican officials also worked with the U.S. to transport deportees deeper and deeper into Mexico's interior. In the 1950s, the U.S. even used ships that transported bananas from Mexico to South Texas to bring 2,000 deportees a month back south into Mexico to Veracruz and Tampico. How did this binational enforcement system function? What role did it play in laying the groundwork for what we see today with countries from Mexico, south into Central America, all over the place, being instrumentalized as proxy U.S. immigration enforcement agents, extending the border ever outward? Yeah, this is a really important history. So um, beginning in the 50s in particular, um, the United States and Mexican governments work together to deport Mexican nationals down into the interior of Mexico. They did this by boat, by train, by truck, um, by a variety of, of methods. Um, and the interest there of the Mexican government was to reduce the number of people who were crossing into the United States outside of the boundaries of the Bracero program. So the Bracero program is important to the Mexican government because then they can control the flow of migrants. They can slow it down when labor is needed in Mexico. They can speed it up when they needed an outlet for um, unemployed or underemployed folks. So the, as the national government wanted to control that flow. There is certainly uh, a precedent there for what we've been seeing in the last maybe 10, 20 years about, for example, United States investments in Plan Mexico, which is a part of you know offering billions of dollars to Mexico to to beef up its border enforcement um, along its southern border. So these are all contemporary practices that have very deep roots. And I guess I would just track it back to, as we were just discussing, there are you know, local national interests of Mexico's participation in this program. There's also the profound power of U.S. capital um, across borders that is influencing these kinds of practices and policies and decisions and collaborations over time. One of the most remarkable things about the border is that it sort of achieves its legitimacy by presenting itself as this this line, this boundary between two countries, when in fact, like you were just discussing, it expands ever outward from the imperial center, but then also inward into the metropole. And you write that from the get-go, the border patrol was policing not just La Linea, but but this expansive borderlands territory. Quote, border patrol officers in the Texas-Mexico borderlands broadly policed Mexicano mobility instead of enforcing the political boundary between the United States and Mexico. That's definitely true today. So what did the border patrol conceive of as the territory under its jurisdiction? And how did that lay the groundwork for this 
absolutely massive territorial scope and scale of Border Patrol operations today that subjects so many people to a border police state, even when they're just traveling between two domestic locations. And now, with the creation of of DHS after 9-11, Border Patrol, as part of what under Trump has been exposed as a federal police force hiding in plain sight. Well, yes, who are... Brothers and sisters in Portland, I say, welcome to the borderlands. Um, this is how we have been policed for for decades. Um, and, of course, look forward to building with you all when we are engaging these campaigns that are about defunding police and abolish ICE to strip away the carceral state that has been really damaging so many of our, our communities. In terms of how we got here, the Border Patrol, from very early on, was less focused on policing the political boundaries between the United States and Mexico, the United States and Canada, um, and more explicitly focused on policing the people presumed to be undocumented or non-belonging within the United States. And that shifted quickly and dramatically to the southern border and to focusing on Mexican immigrants for the reasons we discussed um, before. By the mid-1940s, early 1950s, the U.S. Border Patrol, you know, rather um, casually and informally decided that a person was in the process of getting to their point of arrival within the United States within 100 miles of the border. So it claimed as its jurisdiction anywhere between the political boundary and 100 miles away from it. And so long as somebody was um, moving within that zone, they were subject to Border Patrol force. Over time, that's become accepted as um, the common practice. And so at this point, 100 miles from any land or sea border is the Border Patrol's jurisdiction. Which is where I'm guessing the major, a solid majority of my listeners live. Yeah, about two thirds of the the people who live in the United States live within that 100 mile border zone. Um, Most of our major cities are within that zone. Um, So Los Angeles, San Francisco, New York, Detroit, um, I believe the entire state of Florida are all within that that zone. (laughs) Sorry, Um, no Fourth Amendment. (laughs) And and this is the point, right? So, so long as the Border Patrol is engaging in immigration law enforcement, Fourth Amendment rights are... Um, restricted. Um, They're not totally wiped away, but they're restricted. So we all live, well, maybe not all, a good number of us live within the jurisdiction in which our Fourth Amendment rights, uh, protections against unreasonable search and seizure, have caveats in the area of immigration law enforcement. Now, once the Border Patrol uses its reasonable suspicion to pull somebody over for um, an immigration violation, a perceived immigration violation, which we know is deeply racialized, um, that opens up the gate to all kinds of federal law enforcement because they're cross-deputized in a variety of ways. So this is a very important issue for all of us to consider um, about the power of the Border Patrol to engage in everyday policing um, in the borderlands. And, you know, like I say, welcome, folks. You all are living in the borderlands, too. And so this is part of our struggle from... New York to L.A. to Florida um, and elsewhere. At a number of checkpoints across the Southwest, a lot of what Border Patrol agents staffing these things are doing is arresting Americans in transit from one domestic location to another for weed, not picking not even picking up undocumented immigrants. Yeah, I mean, this is really important. So we're working on a project now um, at UCLA with the Million Dollar Hoods Project in collaboration with the ACLU, which looks at a good number of years of recent Border Patrol data in which they discuss why they pulled over people um, who were driving or walking in the borderlands um, area. So not on the border, but in the borderlands area. And time after time, it's brown people, Mexicans and Central Americans, who um, raised suspicion because they either looked the Border Patrol officer in the eye or they didn't look the Border Patrol officer in the eye because they switched lanes too fast or they switched lanes too slow, right? So there was really 
no logic to what, what, what created reasonable suspicion other than the fact that the through line is that all the people they pulled over um, were Latinx, right? Disproportionately um, male and had very little money on them. So this is the, sort of the, the data set that we have tells us how much money people had in their pocket. So that is consistent with history. That was constructed over time, this notion that the undocumented is a Latinx immigrant or person, and the notion that Latinx people within the United States are suspect of being undocumented. When I was reporting a story in 2015, a CPB official told me on the condition of anonymity that race and nationality could be factors, just not the only factor in enforcement, according to their internal rules. Uh, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled in 1974 in Brignone Ponce that um, race is a legitimate factor in the consideration of immigration stops. And when I say race, I mean, quote, Mexican appearance, legitimate factor to consider in immigration law enforcement. So if you are of, quote, Mexican appearance, if you are within 100 miles of the border and you happen to be walking away from the border, right? So if you're in LA and you're walking due east, or if you're in El Paso and you're walking due north, um, these are this is a constellation of factors that could make you legitimately suspect for immigration law enforcement. And race is one of those factors. So that's not on the down low. That is the United States Supreme Court stating that. So this is what is really interesting. When we go back to Arizona and they talk about, what was it SB 1070? And they defended that by saying, we're only going to do what's constitutional. And everyone presumed that racial profiling was not constitutional, right? Well, the U.S. Supreme Court has already weighed in on that when it comes to immigration law enforcement, saying that you can use, quote, Mexican appearance as a legitimate factor in immigration law enforcement. That's the piece that they weren't telling everybody. Another piece that didn't get that much attention was that the Obama administration's attack on SB 1070 was that Arizona was infringing on the federal government's prerogative to do immigration enforcement and that indeed the federal government was already uh, using local police officers, law enforcement all over the country as a front door to the deportation pipeline. Yes, absolutely. (laughs) (laughs) An important part of this prehistory that your book so powerfully tells to today's border security politics begins with this remarkable rancher and farmer rebellion against the Border Patrol in the late 40s and early 50s. You write, quote, They had built empires based upon controlling land, water, and the mobility of Mexican migrant workers, but the region's agribusiness elite was losing its grip. Beginning during World War II, the officers of the Border Patrol directly answered to supervisors outside of the borderlands and operated according to a complicated politics of migration control that extended as far north as Washington, D.C. and as far south as Mexico City. Farmers and ranchers in South Texas rebelled against their loss of influence over migration control and fought to return the Border Patrol to its local roots. In the process, they emerged as unexpected critics of the patrol's racialized focus upon policing persons of Mexican origin. And managing this rebellion, you write, and this is it's a remarkable book, and this is perhaps the most remarkable part of it, is that the infamous deportation campaign of that era was actually about managing this rebellion. Explain the conventional story about the Eisenhower era mass deportation campaign. What what you discovered was actually happening behind Commissioner Joseph Swing's media spectacle and what the new settlement was over policing the labor supply that took shape as a result. Well, sure. So the traditional story at this point, the prevailing story of what is known as, and I apologize for my language here, but this is the historical language, um, Operation Wetback of 1954, is this, that there was a surge of undocumented Mexican migration, and therefore President Eisenhower and the head of the INS, General Swing, organized something called Operation Wetback, an aggressive immigration law enforcement campaign to go out, deport all the Mexicans, and then um, seal up the border. And so part of that prevailing narrative is that the Border Patrol deported over one million people during the summer of 1954, and that that 
somehow did away with the crisis of undocumented immigration. And following that surge of immigration law enforcement, the border crossing stopped, the problem was solved, and we could move forward. So there's a couple layers to this narrative. One, that law enforcement works, <laughs> it, which it doesn't, and we'll get to that in a second. And that the crisis was about Mexican immigrants. That wasn't what was happening at all, right? The crisis was about um, these farmers and agribusinessmen, largely in Texas, but across the Southwest, who were refusing to use the Bracero program and continuing to hire Mexican workers outside of its purview as undocumented laborers. They simply didn't want to have to deal with the requirements of the Bracero program, such as, you know, providing health insurance to their employees, abiding by a minimum wage, having inspectors come in and check the conditions of work. They didn't want none of that. So they continue to hire people outside of the boundaries of the Bracero program. And you have these two nation states, the United States and Mexico, who said, no, this is the program that we have established to facilitate the flow of Mexican workers in and importantly, out of the country. And we expect you to utilize it. So there was enormous tension building between the Border Patrol and the farmers in, in Texas. So what Operation Wetback really is, is a campaign to force the farmers in South Texas to comply with using the Bracero program. They do that through the bodies and the lives of Mexican workers who are the ones who become the targets of a aggressive immigration law enforcement campaign. So of course the Border Patrol, because who they're really speaking to is this farmers in South Texas, they begin the campaign in California as a demonstration, as a threat, as a warning to South Texas to say, look, we're gonna come through, we're gonna raid restaurants, we're gonna raid parks, we're gonna raid um, neighborhoods, we're gonna raid your farms and we're gonna sweep up everybody and we're gonna get them out. So we're coming, we've demonstrated to you the power of what we can do here in California. We're coming to South Texas to clean out your workers, they might say. And so they they went to South Texas, the workers went to South Texas before they began the raids and began to negotiate with um, farmers. Some complied, some did not. The raids followed. So the whole point of Operation Wetback was to get these farm work, these farmers to comply. And the other piece here is that they told the story that they deported over a million people that summer. That's just a load of malarkey, let's say. <laughs> a commonly repeated load of malarkey that I I think I'd heard repeatedly up till re- I read your book. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, it's well. Here's the other piece of it is Operation Wetback in 1954 was so terrifying and traumatic for Mexican and Mexican-American families that the notion that they deported over a million people felt very real, right? When you're hearing and you're seeing threats in the press every day, when you're seeing these calculated, choreographed raids that are supposed to induce terror— And just two decades after this mass repatriation campaign of the early Great Depression. Exactly. Of of course it feels real, right? And so um, many of us have told this tale that there was over one million um, deportations. But when you get into the Border Patrol's archives and records, it's clear that they are... They're fudging the numbers. They're cooking the books left and right. Um, I I don't remember the number. Maybe you've got it in front of you from the book. But they actually forcibly removed, i.e. deported, far fewer people than they announced in the press. And this is important because after that summer, what happens is not a reduction in the number of people of cross, right? So law enforcement didn't come in, swoop down, and dissuade people from crossing the border. What happens is they demobilize all of their aggressive task forces, um, their planes, their trains, their automobiles, and basically stop enforcing immigration law. So the flow of people remains the same. It's simply the actions and activities of the Border Patrol that shift between 1954 and 1955 that leads to a dramatic drop off in the number of people who are being arrested, or I should say apprehended and deported. Um, So the point there for me is that one of the lessons that we thought we got out of Operation Wetback of 1954, and this is a lesson that our current president (laughs) thinks is true, 
um, is that law enforcement worked, right? That there was a crisis of people who were crossing the border, aggressive immigration law enforcement came in, people stopped crossing the border. That is not at all what happened. It was all smoke and mirrors, which again would be in tune with this current president that led to the drop off between the so-called 1 million deportations of the summer of 1954, which never happened, and the far fewer deportations that happened the year after. Um, once they won the compliance of the farmers in South Texas, they were done aggressively enforcing immigration law. You had this weird dynamic where you had white agribusinessmen accusing the Border Patrol of barbarity against Mexican workers, and then labor activists accusing the growers of presiding over monstrous slavery-like conditions. Well, let's uh, let me step back a second. So the 1920s and the 1930s is really this period where the Border Patrol is effectively a local law enforcement agency scattered across the borderlands with the authority of the federal government. World War II changes that. And the shift of the Border Patrol and immigration control from the Department of Labor into the Department of Justice, the recruitment of new officers from across the country who knew nothing about the borderlands, um, the development of new national training systems, in some ways creates a different Border Patrol. It still has its roots, right? <laughs> Absolutely, it's got its roots, uh, which carry forward. And you have these new officers who are not as connected to local farmers. So, whereas in the 20s and 30s, these local law enforcement uh, border patrol officers could, one of the ways you extract power is yes, by deporting somebody's workers, but also by coming in, threatening to do so, and then not doing it, right? So you you gain access to the the power brokers. These new officers who come in in the 40s and the 50s um, don't have those relationships, aren't working out those personal politics that have been brewing over time. And instead, they're just coming in and they're following the, the legacy of the Border Patrol in targeting Mexicans. But they do so much more, not necessarily aggressively, that wouldn't be the distinction, but without regard for the interest of the local landholders and agribusiness. And this is what rankles the agribusinessmen. It's not so much that their workers are being deported because in the past they had utilized deportability as one more pressure point against Mexican workers. But now you had the Border Patrol coming in after World War II and totally disregarding any arguments from agribusiness about hey, can you come back next week, maybe? Uh, let us finish the, the harvest right now. And it's that tension that develops in the 1940s and the 1950s that leads agribusinessmen to say that the Border Patrol is an abusive organization, to say that they're advocating on behalf of the people who work in on their farms and in their, in their industries. And that tension really explodes into the outbreak of what is now known as Operation Wetback of 1954, which um, we often think of as a campaign against Mexican immigrants, which it certainly was. It was also a campaign against agribusiness to get tell them to get in line with the Bracero program and to process their workers through this federal bilateral program. And that smoke and mirrors that we see under swing it really seems to be a template for a certain performance of of border security that meets a confluence of contradictory interests but only really provisionally that's true when we look at the spectacle of border security with with operation hold the line in 1993 rolled out in el paso which then which creates this kind of like eureka moment of you know there's never been political will to enforce the border what and now sylvester Reyes, the congressman to be but at the time the first Hispanic Border Patrol sector chief, this the sense that uh, he had done what was deemed impossible, and now the idea was security works, or even back to IRCA in 86, or the Secure Fence Act of, of 2006, but it never really works as advertised. It maybe works for a few years, as we saw in the late 90s, when the early 90s nativist explosion sort of briefly subsided. How does this dynamic from the early 1950s to the present play out where there's this performance of border security that provisionally works and then fails? What happens when those contradictions of border security politics keep heightening? Well, I think one of the most important dynamics of the performance of border security in certainly the post-World War II era 
is the performance of nonviolence resulting in death, right? So uh, one of the things that happens after World War II is a questioning of the direct physical brutality of older Border Patrol officers. You know, the guys who um, would engage in vengeance campaigns, who would shoot immigrants across the border, who would um, beat folks for speaking out of turn. The Texas Ranger types. The Texas Ranger types, right? Yeah. Um, or your everyday local police and South Texas kind of types. So there were new officers after World War II who looked sideways at those kinds of activities. The world also looked sideways at those kinds of activities as we were heading into the civil rights movement. And so they developed, they didn't put violence to bed. They de developed new forms of violence. And one of the things that they did is they actually dug up the fences from um, so several of the internment camps of World War II and took those fences down to the U.S.-Mexico border and shoved them into the sand to create a new kind of um, boundary that would force migrants to cross deep out in the desert. Now, what that does is that Migrants are no longer crossing through small towns and cities on the border, such as El Paso or San Diego or um, any of the other small towns. And which is where they would get into these confrontations with the Border Patrol and everybody would witness this violence. And it pushes the migrants out into the desert um, where the Border Patrol in the 1940s, when they first started doing this, understood that they would be sending people, sending migrants to their deaths, to dehydration in the, in the desert. Um, this is what Operation Hold the Line, Operation Gatekeeper um, doubled down on in the 1990s was this displacement of violence out of the local communities where people could see it and out into the hinterlands, out into the desert where the number of people who were trying to cross um, and died in that process skyrocketed. Can you draw a line from the border security performances of the early 1950s through another round of displacement in the early 1990s in California, through Arizona becoming the epicenter of nativist politics in this country, to, to Donald Trump? What does the, the unrealizable fantasy or promise of border security, how does that structure the sort of pervasive psychosis that increasingly seems to envelop U.S. politics. I think it's the quest for white supremacy to endure without having to have its fingerprints on the bodies of people who are dying, right? So there's absolutely a through line between the post-World War II period, which we still live in, right, and its need to displace the violences of white supremacy to conceal its violences is exactly what was happening in the 1940s and has been revamped and reworked multiple times over, um, over the decades. And this frenzy about creating border fences isn't about security. We all know that no fence for the last hundred years has ever worked as a form of border control or border enforcement. All it has ever done is driven people to take more dangerous methods and measures to be able to cross um, the border in search of work, in search of family, uh, in pursuit of a dream. And there's too much evidence that all these border fences have ever done is sever fingers, harm the environment, and drive people out into the desert to to die, to suffer. And so um, I find it incredulous that anyone today would make the argument that there's any point to these fences other than just that, about displacing, concealing, masking um, the violence of, yes, the state, but in particular, um, the white supremacist state. You write that the Border Patrol retired old-fashioned racist language for Mexican migrants, not so much because it was racist, but rather that increasingly in the latter half of the 20th century, because it framed the object of border enforcement as a sympathetic, maybe pathetic Mexican farm laborer, 
And they supplanted that racist terminology with terms like criminal alien and border violator. How and why did the populations that Border Patrol targeted become increasingly increasingly criminalized after the early 50s? Well, this is where it's important to understand that the history of immigrant, immigration control is a history of the carceral state. So it's almost aligned that at the same moment that we're beginning to talk in new terms about social threats um, within the United States as being criminal threats, that that's happening um, along the border and in relationship to Mexican immigrants in particular during this time period. So the logic of control, the articulation of control shifts in the 40s, the 50s, into the 60s away from an understanding of Mexican undocumented immigrants as being um, laborers who just you know need to be managed to so-called criminals who need more aggressive forms uh, of management. So I would host all of that within the rise of the carceral state writ large, that this was happening across the country and in relationship to different communities, that we were stitching together a new logic of social control. And of course, that's what was happening on the border as well. And that's part and parcel of the shift um, toward the so-called description of the crisis as a, as a crisis around crime and the so-called criminal alien. And it happens, the brilliant thing is it happens overnight and you can see it in the memos that we're going to stop calling people undocumented workers, right? We're going to begin calling them criminal aliens because that better reflects our understanding of the, con- the current crisis, but it also could generate um, a stronger response from the broader public. And you write that the drug war played a key role in transforming the border patrol during this period. Border Patrol agents were mandated to in also enforce customs laws. It expanded its mission to police what increasingly became both a top domestic and international political priority, one that really collapsed the dom- the distinction between the domestic and the international at the border and in the borderlands, while all the while, you write, making the agent's task even more quixotic and the people they pursued all the more demonized. This starts really early, you write, with the Border Patrol establishing the Criminal, Immoral, and Narcotics Program in 1956. You write that the new mission, quote, simultaneously created an increasingly dangerous and stressful work site for Border Patrol officers and provided a new logic of impunity that justified even the most egregious acts of violence committed by Border Patrol officers. How did the longstanding cynicism among agents that you describe explode into fantastic violence by the 1970s and 80s in a way that sort of reverses the shift that you describe taking place between the original generation of Border Patrol agents to the the, the second generation, where the violence was more sublimated into the landscape. What, what role did the dr- drug war play in making this explicit rampant abuse explode the way it did? Well, all violence needs a logic. Right. Um, And so what was happening in the 40s is there was a mismatch between the old logic of sort of what you might call pot bellied white supremacy um, saying, well, they're just dirty Mexicans. That's why we beat the shit out of them. That was not sustainable anymore after um, as we move into the civil rights movement. And so you needed a new logic of that violence. And the fences are a part of it, simply displacing the violence outward. Like, hey, we're not doing this. It's not us. And then also the rise of the war on drugs becomes a new logic as to creating, as you suggest, to demonizing people, creating a a sort of a a logic about why the violence is appropriate against this population. So that's what the war on drugs does for immigration control, is it it legitimates new forms of aggressive violence against um, immigrant bodies, Mexican immigrant bodies in particular. Does the mass criminalization of Mexicans with the imposition of, of tight immigration restrictions on, on legal migration, first in 1965 and then more stringently in 1976, does that intensify the legalization of Mexicans? Does that play a role in, in the increasing way in which Mexican migration is forced into illegal pathways, play a role 
in the deepening violence in the 70s and 80s? Well, I mean, of course. So a lot of people have done work on the Immigration Act of 1965 and the way that it put the first numerical caps on the number of Mexican immigrants, um, immigrants from the Western Hemisphere, allowed to enter the United States every year. And that that cap was far below the number of people who were at that time already crossing lawfully um, into the United States. So it was a setup. And to... a year after the Bracero program was terminated at that. Yes. Yes, absolutely. This is a year after the Bracero program was terminated. Of course, this is right amid all of the massive civil rights legislation, the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act, that you have the structuring of the rise of the undocumented Mexican population. Um, so, you know, it, it was baked in that we were going to have this escalation and surge of undocumented immigration in the post-1965, really the post-1967, 68 world when that law becomes um, implemented. And we have at the same time the formulation of a new logic about why it's so important to aggressively police this community um, of border crossers. Um, so that's certainly the war on drugs. It's the criminalization of the character of the undocumented immigrant as well. It's the cross deputization, as you say, of border patrol agents as DEA agents. So it's really unclear what work they're doing out there in the borderlands. Um, all this is happening at the same time. And so, yes, it, it was a setup that the, the surge of undocumented immigration in the post-1965 world would be culturally and politically and legally criminalized. And the, the, the violence during this period that I read about researching my own book was just constant, pervasive, sur surreal. One case, the border, I don't recall the year, but I think in the 1980s, the Border Patrol sent an undercover agent to investigate reports of abuse at a California highway checkpoint, and they were beaten severely. Yeah, I didn't know that story, but it doesn't surprise me. I mean, look, I came to this work because I grew up on the border in the 80s, um, in the early 90s. And this kind of brutality was mundane, and nobody really questioned it. The way in which Border Patrol would you know, wrap people over their heads with their batons by the side of the road and people would just keep on driving by. Those are those are the illegals, right? That was sort of the logic of the, the day. And I shouldn't say nobody protested. Of course, there were organizers who were protesting, but the prevailing logic was that this made sense. They entered the United States in violation of our rules, they're border violators, they're criminals, um, and they deserve this aggressive law enforcement response. So for me as a child growing up and laying witness to all that violence and being blessed to come from a family that questioned that violence, questioned that logic, questioned the notion that any human being could be illegal and understood that that was a structure in place that needed to be dismantled. It really, as I, I believe we talked about earlier, it was the, the trauma of growing up in the borderlands and witnessing this violence that that drove me to do the work that I've been doing for the last 20 years on you know racial violence in the state border policing and the rise of mass incarceration you know all of this you write quote chronicling the border patrol's rise in the US Mexico borderlands as a matter of policing in modern america reveals how the past of mexican browns and black americans cross in the carceral era my question is what is obscured when we don't include the Border Patrol in our history of American policing, in our analysis of it, and in our analysis of the racialized political economy of the carceral state as a whole? And then what do we learn, including about how to dismantle it, when we do include it? Well, when we leave the Border Patrol out, we leave out probably what's the second largest police force in the country out of the conversation. We leave out the massive jurisdiction of surveillance that the Border Patrol um, operates within and conducts. So yes, I'm talking about the 100-mile border zone, but I'm just talking also about all of the stops, um, the observations, the questions, the fear um, that they have brought along with them. We miss the story of 
immigrant detention and deportation as processes of human caging and forced removal, um, just because the U.S. Supreme Court said that those are apprehensions um, and civil infractions rather than crimes and arrests and imprisonment doesn't mean it's not so, right? The experience of apprehension is the experience of arrest. The experience of detention is the experience of imprisonment. The, the experience of deportation is the experiment, experience of punishment. And so we've allowed the state's definition of this set of practices as non-criminal to determine our analysis of the crisis. Now that certainly has changed in the last 10, 15 years that um, the rise of the study of crimmigration and organizers on the ground, people, young people who are experiencing both um, mass incarceration and mass deportation have really led the thinking on how these two regimes intersect and really support one another. So moving forward, I think it's absolutely critical to understand Really, the dexterity and diversity of the operation of the carceral state has to include an analysis of immigration control. Um, it's also obviously going to have to include an analysis of the distinctions of policing between reservations and so-called U.S. cities, right, and those border towns. So there's all these different jurisdictions at work in the carceral state. And we've got to be thinking about all of them. Um, and immigration control is particularly massive. And by allowing the state's definition of immigration control as being an administrative act as opposed to um, crime and punishment, we allowed them to veil off one of the largest sectors of the carceral state. And of course, that helps us to, when we unveil it, um, we bring the stories together. It allows us to better see how um, our various communities black and brown, um, in this case, are so deeply impacted by this, this regime. Well, Kelly Lytle Hernandez, thank you very much. Thank you. It was really wonderful talking to you. Kelly Lytle Hernandez is a professor of history, African-American studies, and urban planning at UCLA. The author of Migra and City of Inmates, and also the director and principal investigator for Million Dollar Hoods, a university-based community-driven project that maps the fiscal and human cost of mass incarceration in Los Angeles. Thank you for listening to The Dig from Jacobin Magazine. As Marcus once said after noting that the police, the judiciary, and the administration are not deputies of civil society itself, which manages its own general interest in and through them, rather, they are office holders of the state, whose purpose is to manage the state in opposition to civil society. While other podcasts have only interpreted the world in various ways, our point is to change it. We are posting new episodes every week. The Dig was produced by Alex Lewis, music by Jeffrey Brodsky. Our communications coordinators are Julia Rock and Zachary Nin. Our senior advisor is Thea Riofrancos. Check out our vast archives at thedigradio.com. Follow us on Twitter at The Dig Radio, and please find us wherever you get podcasts and subscribe to this podcast. If it's on iTunes or wherever, please rate and review us. Those positive five-star glowing reviews help introduce us to new listeners, apparently. But what really does that is you telling your friends that this show is great, that you like it, and that they should listen to it too. Please make propaganda for us and do find us on Patreon and make a monthly contribution to keep this operation going. Even a few bucks is huge. Mm-hmm.